the second ex example which I have, and that's uh, the example to which is similar to question 34 is referring to. Uh, it's, well, it's not the question 34, but the question 34 in yellow book can be done in a similar method I'm going to show right now. So that's the equation like this. This is, a, again, a quadratic equation. The, dif the difference from the previous one is that the coefficients here themselves are complex numbers. I mean, this equation itself doesn't carry any complex numbers. It just happened that the solution is complex number like this. Whereas in this, in this equation, you already have the C coefficient itself being a complex number. It doesn't make any conceptual differences. In principle, the method follows the same line. Well, this time I will follow this line because my B coefficient is no longer even integer. Uh, but computationally, the solution becomes longer. And you have at least four examples like this in the question 34. So computationally, if I just follow this formula, the solutions I can expect, they will be like, like, they will be like this. Uh, negative of B plus minus square of B and then goes four of the AC product. That's where my complex number will appear under the square root. Well, the bottom side is just two. Well, if you simplify things slightly, you will be facing you'll be facing the expression like this. It's not a final it's not a final expression. This number, this square root, is computable, and that's the extra complexity <coughs> which comes in the solution because of the presence of complex numbers in my equation. So when we going to handle this extra complexity, there are two ways. I mean, we we know one way of computing roots of complex numbers. We discussed this with you two days ago quite extensively. I gave you two examples and things like that. The significant, well, the special thing about those examples was that the numbers we were taking the square roots, or roots, not the, it wasn't the square roots there, there were roots of higher degrees there. The numbers we were taking the roots from two days ago, they were good in terms of converting to polar forms. If you remember conversion to the polar forms of those numbers, it was based on our knowledge of the standard signs and cos values. For this number, you no longer have this privilege. Even if you try that, you won't be able to come up with a nice, a nice angle like pi and 3 or pi and 6 or even pi and 5, which will correspond to this complex number. So even if you go that way, if you, even if you go the way through the polar form or through the uh, exponential form, it's not, gonna give you, it's, not gonna, it's not going to give you any advantage. So in this case, we're going to use a different approach in finding the square root. So you have to realize that when you can convert a number to an exponential form easily, it's the best way to do the roots of a complex number. If you cannot do that, you have to rely on your intuition and decide which way you go. Might be one way, maybe better than the other. And that's the second way we're going to discuss right now. So our, this, our objective right now to finish the solution to this quadratic equation will be finding this square root. And I will find this root this time in the Cartesian form straight away. Look at this. Uh, I will lift it up a little bit because the top side is no longer relevant. So when I look for my square root, what I will do is this. I will assume that my square root has the unknown form like this, a plus ib, where a and b will be the unknowns, real numbers. And I will be looking for them subject to the relation like this because that's what, that, that's what square root here says. We need a number which, if you square it, it will deliver your negative 3, negative 4i. My a and b here, this time, they're just real numbers. So here's my unknown square root. Now, the, after I just made this, uh, after I just announced this idea, the actual solution is just like this. We just expand the left-hand side via binomial formula. Here's the expansion. Square of the first term, double of the product, square of the second term, which comes with the negative because we have an imaginary unit there, right-hand side like this. And now we can equate imaginary part to the imaginary part, the real part to the real part. That will give me two equations with two unknowns. Here's the equations. Here's the equation of the real parts. Here's the real part on the left-hand side. Here's the real part on the right-hand side. Here's the equation for the right-hand side. 
Two equations, two unknowns, only real valued numbers. I mean, only real numbers, no longer complex numbers involved. There are a few ways you can solve that. I'm sure each, each one in this class will have its own preferable way of dealing with these sort of equations. I'll show you mine. That's, that's, that's another reason I mentioned the Vieta's, Vieta's theorem at the top. What I can do is this, look at this. I can square, I can square this into something like this. Right, if I square this, it will be a squared plus b squared equal four squared on two squared, which is another four. And now I can think of a squared and I can think of b squared as my new unknown. So I will think of a squared as x1 and b squared, or negative b squared in fact, as b2. Why do I do that? Because if I introduce these new symbols like this, my two equations will convert into something like this, which is a conclusion of Vieta's theorem. And I can now say that my x1 and x2 are solutions to the unital quadratic equation with the second coefficient 3 and the last coefficient negative 4. So in fact, my x1 and x2, rather than solving this, I will solve just one single quadratic equation like this. Here's my negative p, here's my negative q, so here's my q. That's another advantage of Vieta's theorem. Not only it lets you guess the roots when you need them, when you need those, it also lets you solve the systems like this. So my ad hoc method was that by looking at this, I recognize here the potential for converting this into the canonical Vieta's conclusion, and then from that, I come up with the quadratic equation. For that equation, we have the solutions, right? There's a, there are formulas here on the top of my slide. I'm not going to show it anymore. So my x1 <coughs> will be... Uh, actually, we don't even have to do that. We can guess those. Sorry. We can even guess those. X1 will be... Sorry, X1 will be 1. And X2 will be negative 4. Given that the relation between X1 and X2 and AB is like this, A will be plus minus 1, and B will be plus minus 2. It, doesn't, it is not a coincidence that I put the signs in the opposite order. This relation this relation, it tells me that A and B must be of opposite sign because the product is negative. That's why when A comes with negative, B must come with positive and the other way around. So if I use this A and B in here, that's the missing square root we were looking for. This root of a complex number, we just found it. We see that my root is two numbers, one of them one take double i, and the other one negative of one take double i. So if you, if you sub it in back in here, and you do the arithmetic, your z1 and 2, the solution to this quadratic equation, it is like this. That's a replacement for the square root here. I just sub it in, and here's my two values. Uh, well, you have to tell me where exactly I made the typo. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the answer here, three halves plus one half, it's two. Yes, thank you very much. I see now where I made the typo. Uh, 